Welcome to A.T. Stewart and Sons Ministries. I'm your host, A.T. Stewart. I'm glad you've chosen to join us today as we look into the Word of God. So take your Bibles and let's hang out in God's Word for a few moments and see what God would say to us today. Bibles turn to Revelation chapter 4. When you find yourself going through a difficult time, perhaps an emotionally stressful time, maybe a physically stressful, exhausting time, What attribute of God do you find yourself turning to to find comfort and strength? When you find yourself at the end of your rope and you feel like you cannot keep going, what aspect of God's character do you find yourself turning to to enable you to keep going? Do you turn to His mercy? Maybe His compassion? Maybe His loving kindness. Jesus, in His time of utmost emotional stress and physical anguish and spiritual agony on the cross, turned to the holiness of God to find His comfort and strength. I believe that Jesus not only quoted from Psalm 22, but I believe he quoted the entire psalm as he was on the cross. As he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Yet... You are holy. O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel, in you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. In his time of utmost anxiety and agony and pain, he looked to the holiness of God to find comfort and strength. You say, how how, how do I understand that? I could understand looking to God's compassion. I could understand looking to His steadfast love, but His holiness? Before we're finished today, you will understand why Jesus looked to the holiness of God to find His comfort in His time of adversity, and you will also understand how you can look to the holiness of God in your hardship and adversity and also Find the comfort and strength you need to keep going. We are studying the holiness of God. Last week, we began to look at God's holiness. And I described God's holiness to you last week as His infinite superiority and otherness. God's holiness is His infinite. And that word I am using literally. Infinite means without measure. Boundless. It cannot be comprehended. God is intimately and infinitely above us. He's on a whole different plane of existence. The most simple life form we know is bacterium. You and I are the most complex life form that we know. But the difference between that bacterium, that one cell life form, and you and me, the most complex of life forms, is almost incomprehensible for us. But let me tell you, that is nothing compared to the Difference and separateness between the Creator and His creation. God's holiness is, first of all, His infinite superiority and otherness. And His infinite superiority demands our utmost awe and respect and reverence that leads us in absolute obedience and surrender to Him 
as the one and only holy God. Today we're going to look at the a second aspect of God's holiness, and that is God's holiness is His perfect purity and absolute moral uprightness. His perfect purity. Now usually when you and I think of holy, we think of purity rather than separateness. Although separateness is a primary meaning of the word, purity is certainly also a meaning of the concept. And so when we speak of God's holiness, we're talking about His perfect purity and absolute moral uprightness. We see that in our passage today in Revelation chapter 4. And in respect for the Word of God, let me ask you to stand as I begin reading in verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne, and he he who was sitting was like a jasper stone, and a sardis in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. And around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and upon the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. And out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there were something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. And the first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had the face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night. They do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. You may be seated. The jasper stone mentioned in verse 3 speaks of God's purity. Many scholars believe that this jasper stone is what we know as the diamond today. The jasper stone was clear and translucent. And it represents the purity and perfect moral blamelessness of God. Majestic purity. Now what we're going to do today is we're going to hold up like a diamond, this purity of God, and and like a diamond with many facets, and you turn it and look at it from different directions, we're going to look at God's purity from several different aspects today so that we might hopefully better understand His holiness in the aspect of His perfect purity and absolute moral uprightness. First aspect. God is so pure He is not even tainted by the shadow of sin. The Bible tells us in 1 John 1, God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. In the Bible, light symbolizes purity. It symbolizes righteousness. Darkness symbolizes sin. God is light. In Him is absolutely no darkness at all. His light is the shining forth of His purity, of His moral uprightness. Now, how would you describe darkness? If somebody said to you, define darkness, how would you define it? Darkness is the absence of light. When you don't have any light... There's darkness. But as soon as light enters into the equation, darkness vanishes. Can you cast a shadow on a 25-watt bulb? No. You cannot. Because the light dispels the shadow. You could more easily... Cast a shadow on the sun 
then sin can cast a shadow on God's holiness, on God's purity. God is so absolutely pure that even the taint of sin cannot cast a shadow upon His holiness. In contrast to God's absolute purity, let's look at ourselves for a moment. Our impurity. Take the most righteous thing that, that we can do. Or one of the most righteous things we can do. Take prayer. Even this righteous act of praying for us is filled with impurity. It's tainted not only by the shadow of sin, but by sin itself. You say, what do you mean, preacher? How many times are you praying and your mind just takes off and starts wandering? You just chase rabbits. And then before you know it, you say, oh God, I don't know how I got over there, but I want to come back. Huh? How about that? Same thing about Bible study, a righteous act in itself. But how many times in your Bible study does your mind wander away? Even in prayer, maybe some ungodly thoughts come into your mind. So, contrasted to God's Holiness, not even the taint of sin can cast a shadow upon Him because He is immeasurably holy. Perfect impurity. Holy, 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 the angels say. As I told you last week, to repeat something three times in the Hebrew was to bring it to the superlative degree. Holy, holy, holy. Holy. Secondly, God alone is absolute, perfect purity. God alone is absolute, perfect purity. So they say, holy, holy, holy. In Revelation chapter 15, we read that those who are in the tribulation, the Christians there, even though God has poured out tremendous judgments upon unbelievers, they acknowledge God alone is the Holy One. In Revelation 15, 4. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify Your name, for You alone are holy. God alone in all of creation is perfect holiness. Now, how do you understand, again, God's purity? If you're in a dark room, there's no light at all, completely dark, and you have a flashlight. Now, you turn on that flashlight, you can see the brightness of that light, but it's hard for you to really judge accurately how bright that flashlight is because everything else is so dark, right? If you really want to see how bright that flashlight is, take another light. I bought a light uh, several years ago at one of these uh, auto parts store that claimed, it was a big one too, had the brightness of a million lamps. Now, you take that light and put it next to the flashlight and, and you can see the difference. So if we're going to see the holiness of God, His purity... We've got to figure out some other being that is pure that we can measure God's pure, purity next to. Well, where can you and I go in all of creation to find any beings that have a measure of purity? We can't look to ourselves. Now let's go to heaven. And let's go to the angels in heaven. Now, the angels in heaven have never sinned. Not in word, not in thought, not in deed. They are sinless beings. And so they have a measure of purity. But compared to God's purity, it's almost like it's no purity at all. Now you walk around your neighborhood. Have you ever done it at night and you notice all these little doorbell button lights? What happens to those lights during the day? You don't see them during the day. They don't have a photo cell that turns them off during the day. But next to the sun's light, they're no light at all. You see what I'm getting at? Now you and I are like darkness. 
So hey, even the angel's purity looks bright compared to our purity. But when you put it next to God's purity, it's like that doorbell button light next to the sunlight. You don't even notice it. In Isaiah chapter 6, notice the angels. The seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face. Why? In front of the holiness of God, he had to cover his face in weakness. It goes on to say, with two he covered his feet. He covered his feet in shame before the holiness of perfect purity. And with two wings he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Compared to infinite purity, even the sinlessness of the angels is not even considered purity at all. Job speaks about this over in Job chapter 4. He puts no trust even in his servants. And against his angels, he charges error. Now what does that mean? I mean, they're perfect. I mean, they've never sinned, they're sinless. So how can he charge error against them? Because as created beings, they love God as much as they can, but they don't give Him the love He deserves. He deserves infinite love. And they cannot love Him that much. He is perfect purity. He is a son. They are only the doorbell button. And compared to His purity, as if they have error. Now, if sinless angels cannot stand before the perfect holiness and purity of God, what about you and me? He goes on to say in Job, beginning with verse 17, Can mankind be just before God? Can a man be pure before his Maker? Of course, the answer is understood to be no. Because he puts no trust even in his servants. And against his angels he charges error. How much more those who dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed, Before the moth. If the angels cannot stand before His purity, how much more you and me who are made from the dust, who are filled with the taint of sin, stand before His purity. And so God's purity is so great that sin can not even cast a shadow upon it. His purity is absolute and perfect. Thirdly, God's is so holy, so immeasurably pure, morally perfect, He cannot stand to look at sin. Habakkuk talks about this in his book. He says in chapter 1, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord God, my Holy One? You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. God is so holy that He cannot, He will not even look at sin. David says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, he will not hear my prayers. In Isaiah's day, God said to the people of Israel, your sins have caused a separation between me and you. He is absolutely free from any moral evil. He is perfectly righteous and just. And he cannot and will not associate with sin and unrighteousness and impurity. Sin is so repulsive to God that He had to turn His face from His own Son, Jesus, when Jesus became sin for us. 
And Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As much as the Father loved the Son, His holiness required Him to turn His face away from Jesus when He became sin on our behalf. If sin has broken the fellowship and broke the fellowship between God the Father and God the Son, how much more has our sin broken our relationship to God? So God is so holy, He cannot and will not stand in the presence of sin. The fourth aspect of God's purity. God's holiness means He always acts in total conformity with His perfect moral purity. God never does anything that is not morally pure and perfect. In Psalm 89, verse 14, we read, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Loving kindness and truth go before you. God's throne represents where He rules and reigns over creation. When it says the foundation of His throne or righteousness and justice, what it means is every decree that goes out from God, every will of God that goes forth has in its foundation righteousness and justice. Everything that He does is just. Everything that He does is righteous. God is absolutely free from any moral evil or imperfection. And so therefore everything He does must be perfect and righteous and holy. Since He will not associate with sin, then everything He does It has no association with sin at all. Even when He pours out His holy wrath in the end days upon those who have rejected Him and those who have worshipped the Antichrist, the angels cry out in Revelation 16 that God has only done what is just. And I heard the angel of the water saying, Righteous are you who are and who were, O holy One, because you have judged these things. God is holy in everything that He does. Jesus called on the holiness of God in His time of extreme physical and spiritual and emotional agony because He knew that everything the Father had willed to happen to Him was just and holy and righteous. He could trust Himself to God who judges righteously. When you and I are going through our difficulties, our hardships, you can find comfort in knowing that God is being righteous and just in your situation. And because God is righteous and just, He can only will... Now listen, He can only will what is best for you as His child. As a Christian, God's holiness requires, demands, that He only will in your life that which is actually the best for you. Now you may look at it and say, man, I cannot see how this is best. But hey, He's so much further above us, you're trying to get into God's territory, and that's way above your pay grade. Our place is just to accept the truth of it. God, because you are a holy God, I know this is happening to me is your best plan for my life. It's your highest good for me. And so on the cross, Jesus could could say, Thou art holy. You're doing what's best, what is just. It was accomplishing our salvation. Joseph understood this. Remember his brother sold him into slavery. I mean an evil act. We're going to kill him and finally sold him into slavery. He was lied against by Potiphar's wife. He was thrown into the dungeon. 
He went through all kinds of hardships and sufferings, evil acts. But when he was finally brought out of the dungeon and made second in command to Pharaoh, and he met his brothers who had sold him into slavery, you remember what he said to them? You meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. God is so holy. He can even take the sinful acts of humanity and work good and bring about His best plan for your life. Now that's how you can find comfort and strength in your adversity. Looking to the holiness of God. Now, because God is so pure, so morally perfect, acceptance with Him on the basis of anything we can do is absurd and absolutely impossible. It would be more possible for you to create the universe than to be do anything to make yourself acceptable to God. You hear me? Several years ago, I went to Mammoth Caves in Kentucky and went down in the cave. Maybe some of you have done that, but they get you down there and they cut all the lights off. Make everybody turn the cell phones off. And let me tell you, it's dark. There is the total absence of light. You cannot see your hand in front of your face. I put it there to see. You can't. I mean, it is total darkness. Now, as a human being, you and I cannot create light within ourselves. Now, we can create noise. We do that a lot. But we cannot create light. Now, I think God's given us things in the physical world to help us understand spiritual realities. You remember that? I think the sun is so bright, it's, it's again, reminds us of God's absolute purity. It's like that brightness of light. Now, you could more easily produce light within your body than you can do anything to earn acceptance in the presence of holy God. That's why it's impossible. God made it that way. He made it so we couldn't produce any light. I think because He wanted to show us that's how useless it would be for us to try to earn any holiness in ourselves, any purity that would enable us to come into His presence. And even if we could, we'd still be like the doorbell button. We couldn't approach His perfect holiness and righteousness. But let me tell you the good news. What God's holiness has demanded His grace has provided. What you and I could not do, He has done in the Lord Jesus. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. None seeks after God. That's us. But God has made a way. Over in Hebrews chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews is talking about the Old Testament sacrifices and how they had to be offered repeatedly because they were just a shadow of the coming sacrifice of Christ that would really wipe away sin. They had to be repeated continually. And he's talking about that and he contrasts it with with the sacrifice of Christ. Listen. Every priest stands daily, ministering and offering time after time, the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he, speaking of Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of, of God. Jesus entered into a tabernacle in heaven, and in his death, he 
secured the redemption and the forgiveness of all the sins of His people. And it says He sat down. That means He completed the work. There's nothing left to do. He finished it. He paid the price totally. And therefore, He sat down. It was completed. For by one offering, He has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. You see that word sanctified? It's the same word as holy. We don't have the English word holified, but if we did, that's what it would say. And it'd make more sense to most of us, right? He has made us holified. He goes on to say, And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them. Then he says, And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. That's forgiveness. The blood of Jesus covers the sins of God's children, of Christians, And he doesn't remember them anymore. He doesn't see them anymore. It's a perfect covering. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there's no longer any offering for sin. We don't need to offer sacrifices today like they did in the Old Testament because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice himself. He did it once. That was it. It was sufficient. Therefore, verse 19, Brethren, since we have confidence to enter... Where? The holy place. How? By the blood of Jesus. You see what God's holiness demanded, and that's perfect holiness, His grace has provided in Jesus. God not only paid the penalty in Christ that our sins deserved, but He did something else. He gave us the perfect purity of Jesus. One of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 5, says, He who knew no sin was made to become sin on our behalf. Why? That we might have the righteousness of the angels. In him. Is that what it says? Mm -mm. Not that doorbell, that door button. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. But the Son. That we might have the righteousness of God. Perfect purity. Absolute righteousness. Now that's shouting ground, folks. That's shouting ground. When you understand that hopelessly we stand before a holy God... But yet Christ has done everything necessary. He has given us His holiness. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 17 that the righteous will shine forth as the noonday sun in the kingdom of God. As the noonday sun. We have the full shining purity of Of the Son of God. Praise be His holy name. Let's pray. We do welcome you and I'm glad that you have taken the opportunity to listen to a sermon on our internet. And I want you just to know that uh, everybody in the church is not like me. Uh, I have these fellows up here, our leadership team. Uh, This is Filiberto Medina who is our Hispanic pastor. And our Hispanic congregation meets every Sunday evening at 6.30. This is Paul Kumar. He is our Minister of Community Connections. Uh, And to my left is Mark Baker, who heads up our Reformers Unanimous Ministry, which is a Christian addiction recovery program that meets every Friday night at 7 o'clock. So if you live in the Mableton area, uh, and it doesn't matter what, race you're from, it doesn't matter your cultural background, I want you to know you are welcome at Westside Church. This is where everybody is somebody and Jesus is Lord.
Hope you'll join us soon. Thank you for being with us for this message. Each week, Dr. Stewart gives practical applications and ways to live out the Word of God. If you would like more information, please take a moment to view our website at wbcfamily.org. That's wbcfamily.org.